right, good morning, Colonial. Good to see you this morning. Always, uh, always good to be back. I always chuckle just a little bit when Ron tells the story about my connection with Colonial because, uh, uh, you know, it started off with a phone call with Ron and some of the elders. Uh, I think it was like a Skype call or something like that. And um, they were vetting me uh, to see if I would fit to fill in a week or two. And so they, I don't know how the interview went, but they said, hey, could you come? You know, could we do like two weeks and see how it goes? And I was like, oh, okay. So we, you know, cleared our calendar and I, I made two weeks and I said, okay, I'll be two weeks back to back at Wichita Falls. And two weeks tended, turned into a little over 10 months. So I guess I passed the test at least for a while. And, um, but it, this is uh, Colonial, uh, such a great place to be. Anytime I get a chance or Lauren calls and says, would you, would you mind being up here? I'm always jumping at it because uh, it's good for my soul. I love being here with this church family. It's a great church family. Enjoyed our time together, and I'm going to enjoy this morning. So uh, good to be back, all right? Uh, my, my little daughter, Scout, who's my middle-aged um, child, she's six years old. She's my favorite. I let all the other kids know that, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, they can earn, they can earn that spot. They just got to work a little harder, but, uh, but, Scott, but Scout is uh, my favorite little girl, and uh, she said to me uh, yesterday as I was packing up to leave, she said, Dad, where are you going? I said, well, I got to go to Wichita Falls. She goes, are you going to preach? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be preaching. She goes, where are you going to preach about? And I said, well, you know, and I, before I could get into what I was going to preach about, she said, are you going to preach about Jesus? And I said, well, yeah, I'm going to preach about Jesus. And she goes, okay. She goes, then you can preach about lion, lizards, and bears. And I go, well, I... No, I, I don't know. I don't know about the lion, lizards, and bears. And I don't know if I'll get to lion and lizards and bears today, but we will talk about Jesus today, if that's okay. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to John chapter 5. We're continuing this series on the story of, uh, of the gospel of John. And today we have ourselves in John chapter 5. And as you're making your way there, I, I read an article about two or three weeks ago that was um, pretty sobering for me. In fact, the article basically stated these statistics. That the United States of America makes up 5% of the world population. 5% of the world population. Out of, though we only make up 5% of the world population, we actually consume, as a people, as a country, 80% of the opioids in the world. 80%. So 5% of the population, and we consume 80% of the opioids. And I begin to think about this, and the writer asked the question at some point, which I think was his main point. He says this, why is America in so much pain? Why is America in so much pain? I mean, when you think about it, we live in a sociological phenomenon, this place that we call the United States of America. We have more wealth, more freedom, more education, more opportunity than any people in human history. Not just today, but in human history. We have affluence, we have wealth, we prosper. We are the most prosperous people on the planet. The most probably well-educated as a collective group on the planet. The, 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 the most successful of people on the planet in all of human history. Yet, Something within us still screams out that we're broken. We're completely broken. And I don't know about you, but I've been in times in my life where I've been broken. Some of you are here this morning, and, and you don't know why you're here. Just your friend brought you and said, hey, I know they're going to talk about Jesus at some point, and I know that will be good for this person. So they brought you here because maybe you have brokenness in your life. There's one thing that, that is, has us all in common, which is all of us to some form or fashion, have brokenness in our life. The problem is with our American society is that in the middle of our brokenness, we keep going back to the same solutions. It's almost as if we have to medicate ourselves just to survive or maybe to find some sort of enjoyment. And what we're going to find this morning is I think there's a different alternative. And in the Gospel of John, the first, you know, it has different themes throughout the Gospel of John. I would say the first three chapters of the Gospel of John are quite simply is that Jesus is better. I mean, if you had to sum it all up, John is writing and just saying that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than any alternative that you can think of. Jesus is better than any type of legalism. Jesus is better than any type of religion. Jesus is 
better. And then we get to John chapter 5, and we see Jesus beginning and continuing to do his ministry. And in John chapter 5, let's read the passage together, and then we'll walk through it a little bit closely. And we're going we're gonna to ask three important questions this morning. This is what John writes to us. He says, um, John chapter 5. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Uh, excuse me, holidays. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of six people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying, lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? And the man replied, I can't, sir, said the man. For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed, and he rolled up his sleeping mat and began to walk. Now, this is the story we're going to look at. Now, as you read this story, depending on what type of Bible you have, the translation of the Bible that you have that's in your hands right now or that's on your app right now, you're going to find that there is a, a little bit of a different, uh, there is some differences here. And in John chapter 5, actually in this particular version, the New Living Translation, it actually omits a, a, a verse in here, but in some translations, it's in there. In some manuscripts, early manuscripts, uh, verse 4 would not be in the early manuscripts. But there were other manuscripts that, that were going around that actually had a verse 4 as if the one who was doing the scribing uh, added just a little bit of detail so we understood what was happening at this place they called Bethesda. And so sometimes down at the bo very bottom of your page there will be a footnote. In fact, if you're reading out of your actual Bible right here, there's probably an asterisk after chapter after verse 3, and it gives you like a little footnote. And this is what the footnote says. It says this. Waiting for a certain moment, this is what would happen there at the pool of Bethesda. Waiting for a certain mo movement of the water. For the angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease he had. So that's the footnote, okay? Okay. It's not in this translation, but that's the footnote to give us an understanding that people in those days believed that this place called the Pool of Bethesda had some sort of healing, pow healing power. There was something about these waters that had a healing um, aspect to them. They had some healing value to them. And, and the idea was that when the angel of the Lord came and stirred the waters, the Greek there is troubled waters. That's where Simon and Garfunkel get that. The troubled waters, um, you know, that when the angel would try trouble the waters, the first person to reach the pool would actually be healed. Now, for, for many years, people always debated, and, and they actually used this, this passage right here to, to say that the Bible's not true because they couldn't find this place called the Pool of Bethesda. In fact, this idea of the Sheep Gate, which is what was being described here, they would say it didn't exist. Like the sheep gate. Well, what we know is that in Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah actually refers to the sheep gate as one of the 11 gates of, of the, the walls of Jerusalem. But not only does he refer to the sheep gate, we also know that in 445 B.C., he rebuilt that gate. The, peop the people of God rebuilt the sheep gate. But even furthermore... As, is it, as what happens in Jerusalem and in all of Israel, anytime you start to build something, they begin to excavate. And so we have these things, these people called archaeologists. And what archaeologists do is as they dig and as they excavate, they go down and they look and they study what's underneath the ground. So, for instance, as they're digging, they may find uh, all sorts of things. They may find old skeletons of lion, lizards, and bears. So I got that in for my daughter's scout. They may find these things. Now, they, as they do this throughout Jerusalem and throughout Israel, they begin to excavate. And what they found, exactly as the passage here in John chapter 5, is they actually found the Pool of Bethesda. I have a picture of it right here. It's kind of a, you know, not a great picture. That's from my iPhone. I was in Israel about, uh, about four weeks ago. And that is the actual ruins of the Pool of Bethesda. 
Now, it said it had five colonnades or it had five porches. So they had porches right over to the right. You can barely see it, but you see like a little arch right on the very top right corner. That is the sheep gate. Now, what would happen in those times, as it says in our passage, Jesus would come up to Jerusalem for one of those three holy feasts or holy days, these, these religious feasts that, you, the, the, that the Jewish people would have. It says that Jesus was coming up to Jerusalem during one of those times. And so one of the three feasts, we don't know which one, but he makes his way into Jerusalem. He walks through the sheep gate, and the sh there would be sheep there. Why would there be sheep there? Well, there would be sheep there because the people, when they made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem and would go to the temple, they'd have to make a sacrifice. And so they would, they would sometimes purchase a sheep or they would bring their sheep with them. And they would bring the sheep through the sheep gate. They would sit in a little area right inside the sheep gate and they'd be able to make their way down to the pool of Bethesda to get some water. Or they would bring the water up to the, the sheep to drink. And that's where they would hold the sheep. Now... In this time, it says that Jesus comes to the sheep gate. He goes to the pool of Bethesda, where there were many lame, sick, some that were crippled, some were that were sick, some, some that were invalid, depends on what type of, uh, what, what, what translation you have, to describe the people that were sitting around the pool. Now, it wasn't as if Jesus just all of a sudden walked in. It was like, oh, there's a whole bunch of people here. Like, Jesus knew there were going to be people there. It wasn't, it, this, wasn't, this wasn't an accident. This wasn't, this wasn't like I didn't realize that this place was so crowded. He knew exactly what he was doing. Jesus was always intentional. So he walks down to this place called the Pool of Bethesda that we just saw. Now the Pool of Bethesda, the word Bethesda, it means the house of mercy or the home of mercy. This is where we get the names of the hospital. Bethesda Hospital. It's the house of mercy. And so Jesus comes down to this area called the Pool of Bethesda, the House of Mercy, and he walks up to this man who's been there for 38 years. Now, in the Greek New Testament, this word sick that's used here in the New Living Translation, or in your ESV it may say invalid, the Greek here can mean a couple different things. One, it can mean, it just means, the, the very simplest form is that it's just not whole. Like, the, you're not whole. Now, it can mean that you have a physical ailment, that you're physically sick. Or it could also mean that you have a moral, a moral ailment, that you're not morally whole. And so either way, I think that it works for what we're going to talk about today. Physical, but also spiritually. That we're spiritually sometimes invalid. Sometimes we're spiritually sick. I've been spiritually sick before. I would bet to say that all of us at some point in our life, uh, emphatically, at some point in your life, you've been spiritually sick. And so Jesus walks up to this man, and the passage says this. He says to him, would you like to get well? Would you like to get well? Now that's the first most important question we may ever answer in relation to our brokenness. Do we really want to get well? You would think that the man's been there for 38 years. Of course he wants to be well. I mean, he's been sitting there on his mat for whatever his ailment is. He could be crippled. He could be sick. It may be a moral uh, uh, deficiency. Whatever it is, he's been going to that pool for 38 years, waiting for the angel of the Lord to come and trouble the waters and see if he could be the first in to get healed. And so you would think that, of course, he wants to be well. I mean, for 38 years, he's been pretty consistent that he wants to get well. But I think it's an honest question by Jesus. Jesus looks at the man, and he simply asks, would you like to get well? And for us, we have to sometimes answer that same question. Do we really want to get well? You know, my wife tells me that I'm the worst sick person in the world. She's probably right. Like, uh, and maybe it's just a man thing, maybe it's a husband thing, I don't know. But when I get sick, I mean, it's bad. Like, if I get the flu, I'm dying. I literally think I'm going to die. You know, I can't do anything. I have to lay in bed. You know, when my wife gets sick, you know, she doesn't lay in bed. She still, you know, gets up, takes care of the kids, and she's still doing her thing. But not me, I just can't do it. Like, I, I'm on my deathbed. 
And she says, you know, she'll always, you know, she, I remember early in marriage, she used to kind of take care of me. Now she just like kind of forgets about me. But, um, but early on in marriage, she tried to be caring, probably thinking, oh, his mom was probably so caring. I need to kind of live that out and be caring. But after, you know, 19, 20 years together, she's like, forget it. You're off on your own. But she'll walk in and she'll say, hey, listen, maybe you should try to do this. Maybe you should take this. Maybe you should drink some soup. Maybe you should take this medicine. Maybe you should go to the doctor. And I always respond, oh, no, it just won't work. I'm dying. It's like in the evenings when one of my kids says that they're not feeling good. And I say, well, you know, maybe we should get to bed early so you can be ready for school tomorrow. Oh, no, no, I I can't do it. I can't do it. Why? Because they don't want to go to school the next day. So they're sick, or I get sick, but the reality is I don't really want to get well, it sometimes seems like. And that's sometimes true in life, in the brokenness of our life. Now, your brokenness may be completely different than your neighbor's brokenness or the person sitting next to you, but we all have some sort of brokenness, some sort of something that is deficient, something that doesn't make us completely spiritually whole. As this man sitting by the pool of Bethesda. It could be an addiction that you've struggled with for years. And you just can't seem to get over it. It could be a sin that just always seems to get you. It, it could be, it, it could be a, 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 a spiritual like um, depression that seems to always come in and out of your life. It, it could be brokenness from the past of trauma or hurts. And you can't just seem to get over it. Whatever it may be, we all have some sort of brokenness that, in which we're not whole. And Jesus is simply asking the question, do you want to get well? And it's an honest question. Because sometimes we just don't really want to get well. We can say we do. We can lay in bed and go, oh man, this flu is so miserable. Sometimes I really don't want to get well. And so Jesus asked this question. The man who's been sitting there for 38 years just for the opportunity to get into the pool of Bethesda, just to get into the waters of mercy. And Jesus simply asked, do you want to get well? I can think of a number of other things I might ask as my introductory question. I might say to him, hey, so what happened? How long have you been here? I might ask, you know, um, especially in those days, Jewish theology in those early uh, first century, they would have believed that you, you are invalid or you're sick or there's something wrong with you because of some sort of sin that maybe your dad had or your mother had or maybe your grandfather or your sin. So maybe the question would have been, hey, so what did you do? Like what, what sins in your life that has made you Cripple or invalid or sick or we don't really know his, what exactly his ailment is. What, what did you do? What did your dad do? What did your mom do? Like those would have been kind of some questions that people might have asked or would have asked. But G- Jesus just simply says, do you want to get well? And I think for us this morning, anytime we encounter Jesus who promise us to give us life and life to the fullest, the first question we have to answer when we look at the brokenness of our life is, do I want to really get well? Do I want to get well? Secondly, we have to ask the question, are we double-minded? Are we double-minded? So Jesus asks him, would you like to get well? And listen to his response. I can't, sir. I can't. Well, he's been there for 38 years. We can assume the man wants to get well. But his answer to Jesus was, I can't. I can't, sir, the sick man said. For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. So he has potentially this desire to get well. But there's also this belief that he's carrying that says that I will never actually be well. So he's been wasting his time for 38 years. He he, he may have the desire to get well, but the reality is he's sitting there knowing that, well, you know, sir, I'll I'll never actually get to the waters. He's double-minded. He believes that somewhere in that pool there's some some healing elements to that water, but yet he believes that I'll never actually make it to that water. I'll never actually make it. In fact, his answer isn't even what Jesus asks him. Jesus simply said, 
do you want to get well? It's either a yes or no question. That's not how he answers it. In fact, what he says is, well, I can't get to the waters. No one here to help me. You know, the angel comes down, stirs the waters. I can never quite get there. I've tried. I've crawled a few times. I've rolled. I, you know, I don't know. I try to get down into the pool of Bethesda, but it hasn't quite worked. If Jesus is probably thinking, that's not what I asked. I didn't ask for your excuses. I didn't ask, you know, why you're not healed yet. I simply asked, do you want to get well? But his response shows that sometimes for us in our brokenness, we have to ask the question, are we double-minded? Do we say we really want to get well, but reality is we have no faith that we'll ever actually get well. We have no belief that Jesus can actually transform our life. That Jesus can actually take the brokenness and be the great physician and mend it back together. That he can take the hurt of the past and he can work in it, as Jesus does with mercy and compassion to bring us back and to break us whole. Like, do we actually believe that? James writes about this in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, the, James writes, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And listen, he is a double-minded man or person, unstable in all his ways. How many of us, we recognize the brokenness in our life? And maybe that brokenness has been there for years upon years upon years. And yet Jesus has confronted us, but the reality is that there's something in us that believes Jesus can never fix this. <laughs> I mean, he, he can fix the other person. I've seen him do it. I, I, I saw other people get to the waters. I saw other people come in contact with the, the, the waters of mercy. Like, I've seen that. But, but me, he's, he, he can't fix this. Oh, there's been points in my life where I believe that. That became my belief system. Was that God can fix everybody else's life. God can fix everybody's life that I preach to. But he can't actually fix my life. I was somewhat double-minded. That I saw the brokenness. And you see the brokenness. And this man saw his brokenness. But Jesus just simply says, do you want to get well? Yes or no? Okay, do you believe that Jesus can make him well? Now, Jesus didn't ask him if he had faith, by the way. You don't see that. You don't see Jesus saying, well, do you have faith that I can make you well? That's not what he says. In fact, what he does, does next is he looks at the man and he says these words. If I can find him. He says, he says, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water bubbles up, someone always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. See, when it comes to the brokenness of our life, areas that we know just aren't whole in the gospel, I think the three questions that are critical is, do I really want to get well? Am I double-minded? Do I really believe that God can transform and bring healing to this area of my life? But thirdly is, am I actually willing? Am I willing? Jesus said to him, do you want to get well? Well, sir, I would, but I can't make it to the waters. And Jesus probably just says, okay, whatever, whatever. Listen, it's not about the waters, it's about me. Pick up your mat, stand up, and walk. Like he puts it back on the man. Listen, just roll up your mat that you've been laying on for 30 years. Stand yourself up and walk. You see, I think that when it comes to our brokenness, Jesus is always asking us the same question. Do you want to get well? Are you double-minded? And thirdly, 
are you actually willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Because look what happens. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. It's a miracle. He did what Jesus said. How many times do we want transformation in our life to, 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 to move it more in line with Christ? And Christ is simply asking, okay, but are you willing to do that? Are you truly willing to do that? The addiction that you have, are you willing to take the steps necessary to find freedom that, that I can be your strength, I can be the healing waters, but are you willing to stand up, take the step, in fact, 12 of them, are you willing to do those things to find wholeness? Are you willing? Jesus just simply says, stand up and walk. You know, I love this passage because what we see in this passage is that Jesus actually initiated this whole thing. There were other people sitting around the pool of Bethesda that day. I mean, I've been there. I've seen the little area that they could sit, and they could hold plenty of people. There were other folks there. But Jesus walks intentionally up to this man and has this encounter with him. He initiates it. And, and let me tell you today, Jesus is always initiating with us. He, 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 Jesus is so full of mercy, so full of compassion. He wants nothing more in your life than to see you walk in wholeness and freedom of the gospel. And so he's always initiating and pressing into us, into our brokenness, into the things that we lack so that we can experience the fullness of life. And Jesus initiates this. And it's a little bit different passage than what we find in other areas of the gospel. In Luke chapter 7, we see the centurion as Jesus is walking back down from, uh, uh, he's walking back down from where he just did the Sermon on the Mount. And the centurion comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I have a servant that's sick. Can you come and heal him? Or, you know, would you heal them? And Jesus says, basically says, okay, well, let's go to your house. Where do you live? And the centurion says, no, 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 no. You don't even have to come to my house. For you just say the word and they'll be healed. Just say the word, Jesus. And Jesus even remarks about the centurion. He says, there is no greater faith than all of Israel than this man right here. He believed that if Jesus just said the word, if he just said the word. I think of the leper in Matthew chapter 8 that goes up to Jesus knowing that Jesus could actually heal him. And he simply asked Jesus a question. You can heal me if you're willing. If you're willing, Jesus, you could heal me. He had faith that Jesus could actually do it. And then we see in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, it says that there is a woman who was bleeding for 12 years. And, and she believed that if she could just touch the garments of Jesus, she would be healed. She had so much faith that if I could just... Touch the garments of Jesus, I'll be healed. And that's exactly what happened. These, all have, these are all instances of people with great faith. Now you can look at it and say, well, that's not me. Well, that wasn't the man at Bethesda either. It wasn't like he had an extraordinary amount of faith when Jesus walked up to him. Because if he said, if he did, and Jesus asked the question, do you want to be well? He would have said, yes, because I know you can do it. Like he lacked faith. But Jesus still looked at him and said, okay. I have the faith. I have the strength. I have the power. I'm the great physician. Pick up your mat and walk. Some of you have been, some of us have been struggling with the same brokenness our whole entire life. And maybe we've lost faith. And the good thing is, is like, just like this man at Bethesda, sometimes you just need to have just a little bit of courage left in the tank. What I find is that when it comes to are you, are, are you willing, is that the first step, I believe, to understanding am I really willing to, 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 to be made whole is simply enough tiniest bit of courage to live in authenticity with someone else about your brokenness. To share with someone of your brokenness, about your brokenness. Because what I find is that when you open up and your, your honest assessment about 
who you are, about your brokenness, about your hurt with someone else. It actually builds you up enough, a little bit more courage to have faith that Jesus can actually do this. It's a funny thing. You know, uh, my son and I, my oldest son, 11, Trip, uh, many of you have met him, but we love to hunt. And this year we had a few hunting trips and uh, we went out, we were pig hunting. Actually, we'll hunt for anything, but this particular night we were pig hunting. And, um, uh, and he shot a pig. I won't go into all the details, but he did shoot a pig, but the pig ran off. Sun was going down, and so uh, as the dad, I'm like, okay, this is going to be a long night. Now I know they're pigs. Just leave them in the bushes, right? No, 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 not with my wife. My wife always thinks that we got to recover everything, right? And so, and eat it. All right. So I'm like, all right, son, we got some work to do. So we get out of, the, you know, we get out of where we are sitting. We go where the pig was shot. We, we see the blood trail. And um, I should really be giving this illustration at a men's conference, but that's okay. Just, just hang in there with me. So we see this blood trail, and we start walking the blood trail. We start following it. And we follow this thing for hundreds of yards, and my first thought was, son, couldn't you get a better shot, right? Like, but, but, but we're all excited. The sun finally goes down, and we're still walking, and we get to an area where this pig went into some really deep shrubs and some really deep, just thick, thick stuff, overgrown stuff. And it's just me and my son, and I have a flashlight, and, um, and, and you know, I hand him my iPhone to also use a flashlight, which was absolutely worthless, by the way. But, uh, but I... We get to this place, and I'm like, all right, we got to go in there, you know, hands and knees through this stuff. And my son's like, no, no, Dad, Dad, we don't. Just forget about it, all right? Don't, don't worry about it. Like, I, Dad, I'm scared. I, I don't want to do this. I'm like, come on, son. Let's go. Let's do this. No, Dad, please, please, Dad. And you can actually hear the pig. It sounds like it's about 15 yards from me. And every time I get closer, it starts moving away a little bit further. And so, uh, and, and I don't know if you know anything about pig hunting, but it's not the smartest thing to walk up on an injured pig. But I got to get it, right? And so I'm crawling through these shrubs, and my son is behind me going, Dad, please don't do it, don't do it. Scared out of his mind. All right, so uh, fast forward the story. We finally catch up to the pig. We got the pig, all that, put it in the back of the truck. We get in the truck, and he says to me, Dad, you're like, fearless. You're like the bravest person I've ever met. And, you know, there for a minute, I'm like, yes, I'm my kid's hero. Finally, finally, you know. And he goes, Dad, I, I, man, I was so scared, but you just, you just went in there. You just went in after it. Um, that Dad, man, you, you're like the bravest person I ever know. And I looked at him and I said, son, here's the deal. I'm actually not. He goes, what do you mean? I go, the reality is, if I didn't have you with me, I would have never gone after that pig. And he goes, what? I go, yeah. If I knew that you weren't back behind me with a, an additional gun just in case, I would have never gone in there. I'm not going in there by myself. And he's like, I don't understand. I go, son, this is what you need to learn as a man. This is our man talk. I said, as a man. What you desperately need in your life is other men. That brings courage to fight whatever brokenness, whatever trial, whatever troubles that you have. You cannot go into the thick bushes by yourself. You'll never have enough courage. So son, anytime you go through troubles... Anytime there's brokenness in your life, the best thing you can do is hand somebody a flashlight and say, I have just enough courage to face this, but I need you to come with me. And for some of us, when God, when Jesus is asking the question, are you willing? He's saying, that's the first step. Pick up your mat. Become authentic and invite someone into your journey that will give you the courage and maybe just enough faith to believe that Jesus still transforms lives. Because that's what Jesus does. Anytime Jesus shows up, things change. And say, Jesus, huh, huh, I can't. No, you can't. You can't make it to the pool of Bethesda by yourself. And that's why Jesus walks right up to you, even this morning, and just simply asks, do you want to get well? If so, don't be double-minded. 
and be willing. Be willing. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for our time. We thank you for the wonderful gospel of John. Uh, Father, we thank you for the narratives that we see in the gospel of John that it just reaffirms to us as Christ followers. And, and maybe for some of us who, who aren't Christ followers that are far from God, even this morning, it gives us a picture of, of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, not only the Son of God, but God himself in the flesh that came with all with compassion and with mercy and with great strength. And Father, whatever the brokenness and whatever the trials or the troubles or the hurts that, that have us hung up in our spiritual walk, that don't allow us to experience the fullness of life that you have called us to, may we recognize that the spirit of the living God lives within us. And it's the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead that he can raise me out of my own ashes and make me whole. That's what we believe. In Jesus, it was your works, your, your finished works on the cross, and your subsequent resurrection that sealed the promises that you've come to give life and life abundantly. And so we rest in that this morning. And in your name, amen.